everyone. Good evening. Uh, once again, this is Ali Ahmedi uh, with Tickmill with the Futures Webinars ser Futures Webinar Series and Introduction to the Futures Market. I hope all are doing well and I have had a profitable last two weeks. It's been two weeks since we have uh, done our last webinar and I've got some information to uh, conclude mainly what information is needed for uh, how to conduct and use the the futures as securities and how they're used and then what we're going to do tonight inshallah is start to transfer uh, the conversations in future webinars into what's actually taking place in the marketplace uh, commodity by commodity sector by sector uh, with oil uh, projected forecasts and uh, some information for you to uh, start, let's say, some of your own due diligence and research uh, within the futures product. Uh, getting this evening uh, started, I want to say, uh, for the most part, uh, for the recurring visitors and attendees, uh, informal, not make it so formal, the webinar and conversational uh, in concept. Uh, so I'm able to portray uh, more how it works instead of textbook definitions or hek issue. From that perspective, is a hada nambi am bihdar el layli awal mara isma ali hamedi am bishtagal hala ma tikmil. Uh, as a consultant regarding the future products that they have now uh, added to their uh, investment product line on across their platform. That being said, what we're going to be discussing this evening uh, comes to the taxation. Uh, the outlook, we're going to do the transformation. webinar, which are all on on uh, their YouTube platform and channel, you'll be able to see all of the pre-recorded sessions that, that we've discussed, uh, discussing what futures are, how they're used, uh, what to pay attention to, how to value them uh, from a speculative perspective and Kamana from a hedging perspective and uh, what to look out for uh, when you're looking to make, let's say, maybe do a prediction, but uh, once you've done your research, what types of curves uh, can give you some sort of prediction or indication of, of how the market uh, may be moving in order for you to take a position to either uh, speculate and or hedge and protect your portfolio. Um, the taxation concept, the Ktir Asiri, and it's coming mainly from the U.S. perspective, so is Anna Hadan that is uh, a U.S. citizen and reporting taxes. Tarfu kill kill sini in February from your broker dealer. Uh, they call the 1099 form, where you end up uh, sending in to do your taxes for profits and losses, and you do the taxation accordingly. At the same time, uh, not necessarily for uh, Americans, but non-Americans come in, uh, in countries that do also have their tax laws their tax laws may differ uh, than what the U.S. tax law is uh, for futures, but uh, most taxation laws when it comes to securities, you look at the U.S. market as a standard, not the standard, but a standard, one of the main standards. So is a American and on taxation laws for future uh, for future securities than other countries where taxes are uh, taxed uh, and charged for securities on profits and losses, you will most probably and most likely also find Kamana uh, a, a tax law regarding futures, hopefully in a favorable manner, similar to how the U.S. Uh, looks at them. Uh, starting with that, from the U.S. perspective, uh, the tax advantage that There we go. So basically, the IRC, Internal Revenue Code, 
Minamerka, basically the IRS, they have what they call a 60-40 rule uh, on taxation for futures securities. Uh, that means that 60% of net gains of the futures trading, they're treated like long-term capital, capital gains, and the other 40% are treated as short-term capital gains and taxed like the ordinary income. Yani from the standpoint of U.S. taxation, uh, once again, come in, it may not apply to the country that you're living in or your nationality, but from a U.S. perspective, it's important to know because most of the indices that we're connected to uh, when it comes to futures are coming out of uh, the U.S. markets. Uh, 60%, when we say long-term games, any securities that an investor holds longer than one year, it's one year plus, then the capital gains tax is 20% on your gains. Uh, Short-term uh, securities, if they are realized, and this is all realized, of course, uh, short-term means anything less than one year. Uh, so if you buy something today and you sell it next week for a profit and or a loss, this is considered short-term. If you buy uh, anything today and you sell it you know, further out than a year from today, uh, depending on your capital gains or losses, Kamena, it's looked at long term. Now, 20% is the long term capital gain tax on profitability. When it says ordinary income on the short term, the 40%, Maneta, uh, depending on your current income tax bracket, uh, on an annual basis, what's considered your taxable income uh, would put you in specific brackets and categories of taxation so it's not just a flat rate when it comes to ordinary income obviously the more you make the more taxes you pay the less you make the less taxes you pay and that's what's considered your ordinary income from a short-term perspective now the futures traders they benefit from a more favorable tax treatment than equity traders and the section that they is under the irc is 1256 of the irc and it states that any futures contract traded on the U.S. exchange, which most of these futures contracts that we're connected to with Tickmill are on the U.S. exchange, foreign currency contracts, dealer uh, 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 options, dealer security futures contracts, or other equity options contracts um, are taxed at 60% of the long-term capital gains rates and short-term are at the 40%, regardless of how the trade was opened and what the purpose was for. So it averages out, the short term and the long term, you're looking at a taxation rate of plus or minus 27% uh, overall, which when you look at it from an investment perspective, uh, being able to use and manipulate, but understanding the taxation rules uh, can help you either save from paying taxes if you have some losses in the portfolio that you can shed positions and get out of positions for taxation uh, to save tax payment and or vice versa. So uh, the section 1256 contracts are also marked to market by the end of the year. Now this is a, an important note to take into consideration. When we say mark to market, December 31st, because it's a calendar year from January 1 to December 31, it's marked to market at the end of year, December 31st. And when we say mark to market, we're going to look and say, okay, and depending on what the price is, at the end of that close of business day, at the end of the calendar year, is what the price will be marked at for your portfolio regarding taxation purposes. Regardless, is a shtaraytu one week before or at the very beginning of the year, uh, they're going to look at the price that you purchased it at, and then they're going to look at the price at the end of the year, and they're going to mark it at that particular price, which is marked to market, and then they're going to say, ah, okay, fi ribih aw fi khsara bidda. Hala, in the next few slides, ishrah kun aktar shu maanita. Now, as an example, Masan, anyone trades during the course of the calendar year and buys a contract worth of 20,000 US dollars. And then at the end of the year, December 31st, the fair market value of the contract is at 
the trader will recognize a $6,000 capital gain on their tax return for that year. 2021, so I'm a stomach since the month. So the 6,000 US dollar will be taxed at the 60 40 rate, which means you have 60% is taxed at, if you recall up here, long term, I'm going to highlight it here, which is 20%. And then the other 40% is treated at the ordinary income tax bracket. So depending on your tax bracket, will depend on how much tax you're going to pay. I'll ahead to set the left a lot. But 60% of it is going to be taxed maximum at the 20% uh, capital gains. And the other 40% will be taxed at your income tax bracket level. Now, we fast forward a year later. When all Echir has seen it, Al Fainten Washin, the trader sells the contract. Maneta Sakara. Yani Hon, at the end of 2021, Badu The contract is open, but the mark to market price was at 26,000 when the trader bought it at 20,000. But Masakari the position. Badu open and Neji Masu. It comes one year later, the trader sells the contract for $24,000. In the example, because the trader marked their portfolio at the market for the end of 2021 year and recognized a $6,000 gain, the trader will subsequently book a $2,000 loss when they close the position in 2022. And when you book a loss, a realized loss in your portfolio, this also lowers any taxes that you may owe. So this is also looked at as part of the tax advantages when it comes to uh, trading with futures. Now, should a futures trader wish to carry back any losses under the IRC section 1256, they are allowed to do so for up to three years under the condition that the losses being carried back do not exceed the net gains of the previous year, nor can it in increase an operating loss from that year. The loss is carried back to the earliest year first, and any remaining amounts are carried to the next two years. And of course, the 60-40 uh, rule applies. Now, what does this mean? It means that if you have a gain, where it says here specifically, losses being carried back do not exceed the net gains of that previous year. So the previous year, mark to market, can fee set the left dollar ribe. If this current year can sucker the position at a 8,000 loss, well, it can exceed the 8,000 because the mark to market the previous year can it sit the lift. So the limit would be 6,000 if they were to close uh, more than 6,000 for year 2022. That's all that that means. In, in, the, in the textbook definition of the IRC or Internal Revenue Code under US taxation. Now, close the middle taxation. Very simple, it's a 60-40 rule. This is under US taxation law. I'm not a tax specialist. I would uh, advise anyone that's living outside of the US and pays taxes under any other uh, foreign uh, government or entity that does have taxation laws in place on futures contracts to make sure you understand what the taxation rules are for your particular taxation entity, regardless of where it may be and understand how those would apply. I just gave you an example of how detailed, low beja and easy to understand from a US perspective, they could be more complicated uh, in other countries and other taxation jurisdictions. So it's good to know where you stand uh, from that perspective before you start building your futures portfolio uh, and start trading. And then at the end of the year, and taxation, and before you know it, uh, fatura, and you know it hits you out of nowhere, and that's what we don't want to know. We 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 want to have a full circle understanding of everything from A to Z, how it works, how the futures contracts operate, which we do now. We've been in the previous webinars through how to capitalize and understand what the gains are. Uh, from a uh, capital gains, whether it's ordinary uh, taxation and or uh, capital gains taxation. Now, 
moving on, what we're going to be looking now, starting from this point within this webinar, للمستقبل, inshallah, we're going to start looking at the specific sectors uh, within uh, commodities, within metals, within agriculture, uh, within interest rates, within indices, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to start taking a more in-depth look at the market outlook so that it gives you more information to provide you an informed uh, decision making ability to decide is a sector that you're thinking about getting into or you're already involved in but you're looking for ways to hedge positions you will need to be able to use the research specifically based on the curve whether we're if you can recall from last webinar the types of curves that we're looking for is it backwardation or if it's contagion a contagion so from this perspective moving forward i've started with crude oil since it is a hot topic um, there is a lot of volatility um, it does have a lot of moving parts and at the same time uh russia Ukraine, بعضه ماشي وما حدا نعرفين يمكن فيه تخلص من هلا لأسبوعين يمكن بتطول من هلا لبعد سنة سنتين ثلاثة ما حدا نعرفين بس all of this is out of your control and all of this is diplomatic positioning between you want to call it East West Russia Europe etc etc it is political positioning it's geopolitical tension and at the end of the day, and the outlook from what the market is showing us is irrelevant of whether Ukraine and Russia, believe it or not, ends today. Now, obviously, is a harab khulsit al-yom, ma fi ba'a abadan harab bain Russia or Ukraine, it will relieve some of the pressure on oil prices but neither here nor there inflation has already crept in the largest market in the world which is the u.s market the real inflation rate uh you know cpi the consumer price index that is reported by the u.s government they come out with it on a monthly basis they are saying it's at 8.3 percent but real inflation when you calculate how um El CPI is manipulated, which it is. Uh, that's not a secret, but the manipulation part of it is the sense that what types of goods are they putting inside this basket to come up with the CPI index? And the real rate of inflation is not at 8.3%. It's closer to 12%, the real inflation rate inside the US market. And from that perspective, uh, you have to understand how expensive uh, things have gotten within that particular market. And depending on, on most Americans living day to day, week to week, paycheck to paycheck is what they call it. Uh, now, if we get into energy prices, uh, America, Kilon, 90% mode of transportation is automobile. Most everyone owns an automobile. They have to fuel uh, their cars on a weekly basis, depending on how much they have to travel and use, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not uh, because America is so big and everyone needs a car to get from point A to point B and the public transportation system is not as efficient as, and it's not, the infrastructure is not as thorough as you would find elsewhere. Um, it is a very big development for the American market. Now, for the most commodities, prices are expected to significantly be higher in 2022 than in 2021 and to remain high in the medium term. Now, it's no secret. The S&P 500, excluding today, is down year to date. 13 to 14 percent okay and that's already factored in to interest rate hikes by the by the uh by the fed and 
there would be several more throughout the year where the expected rate should be or it could theoretically be anywhere between two and a half to two and three quarters maximum three percent on on the year end now where will it be by year end come in a heady speculation this is also a futures uh, uh asset class and security that one could speculate and or hedge with as well the interest rate uh, sector now if we go back to where we are with oil uh, this site this information source is coming from relief expand it for you so you can check it out for yourselves there it is reliefweb.int okay now from this particular website which this was taken this information i got last week the price of brent crude oil is projected to average at hundred dollars a barrel in 2022 which is a 42% increase from 2021 and its highest level since 2013. Non-energy prices, now we're getting away from oil, but I want, we're, we're gonna focus on the first sentence in the future slides, but come in just to give you an idea of where we're going and where we're headed with these webinars moving forward uh, in the other sectors. Non-energy prices are expected to rise about 20% in 2022 with the largest increase in commodities where Russia or Ukraine are key exporters. Wheat prices in particular are forecasted to increase by more than 40% this year, reaching an all-time high in nominal terms. Nominal terms means basically in numbers. So I have three specific spotlights as about is about corn. This particular webinar, this is taken from SNP or spglobal.com from the week of May 16th. And what we're going to be looking at within these next three slides and next three topics on market outlook for you to have more information uh, in order for you to have uh, a, a, a better, let's say, outlook and more informed information and research to place your position, make a position, place your bets, depending on your portfolio. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about, Halla, of the three, is the surging U.S. jet fuel prices driving historic rising, rise, or rises in airfares. What does that mean? Jet fuel is a commodity. It's linked to crude oil. Uh, we're going to read here what's happening. The most recent United States CPI report showed that there is a rise of 8.2% from a year ago across all items, but airfares were up 33.3% and increased 18.6% 18, uh, 18 in April alone. Yani, hala, let's look outside of the context of the actual commodity market. Shambasir. Yani, ما خلصنا مية بالمية من كورونا بس خلص يعني ال ال الدول خلص فتحوا يعني except China China is still under a severe lockdown they're going into the fourth week now بس غير China غير بلاد خلص فتحوا which means you have coming post pandemic because uh, it's not considered a pandemic anymore. Uh, so airfares, there have or airliners are having to pay higher prices for fuel because of the geopolitical situation and the inflation that's taken place because of the commodities market in general is rising in pricing uh, in prices. So, but they're not charging on a relative scale. They're charging a premium. Maybe they're trying to make up for lost time. Uh, maybe they're trying to uh, manipulate earnings per share if they are traded publicly, which most airlines are. Yeah, I mean, there's there are a number of reasons, but mainly it's based goes back to the supply and demand. Feed demand. but don't say fru. Yeah, they they're looking now for uh, ways to to get out and make up for the lost time. 
في the last two years اللي كانوا يعني ببيوتهم أو ببلدهم هلا يعني بدهم فيش خلقهم لو سفرة بيخة يعني من مثلا من لبنان لإبروس أو من لبنان لبنان لتركيا أو شو ما كان ناس عم بيرجعوا عم بيسافروا والكوفيد تيستينج اند كوفيد بانديميك ار بيكومينج مور ريلاكسد اند ذا ثينج اوف ذا باست اند بيبل ار جيتينج باست ات اند يوزد تو ذات ناو ذس واز ذا لارجست مانث تو مانث انكريس سينس ذا انسبشن اوف ذا سيريز ان 1963 airlining industry. Spot jet fuel prices have risen 157% on year, suggesting the upward pressure on airfares will continue to possibly worsen in early summer. So, in the context of things, يعني ناس مع عيال ناس بلا عيال اذا عندهم فرصه خصوصا اذا حدا عم بيدرس بالجامعه او الاولاد عم بيدرسوا خلصوا المدرسه العالم هلا they're going to start traveling so the demand is going to pick up more and this is where they are suggesting that the the pricing on uh, on on airfare will continue to increase based on the demand so I'm not saying advice, but if I don't think I'm going to be afraid of it, I'm going to be afraid of it and I'm going to be afraid of it instead of waiting to the last minute because each passing day and each passing week, uh, based on this particular data, prices will be increasing. What's next? The sharp rise in airfares with prospects of further pricing pressures could deter summer travel at the margin over the summer. يعني so, هون, this is what we have to look at as investors and or traders. يعني إذا وصلت لدرجة وين الدماند بعدا عم تطلع. Okay? والسبلاي عم تطلع ما. There's going to come a time where there's still supply, meaning availability to travel, but it's got too expensive for people to make the decision to say, yes, let's do it. They're going to say, well, uh, يعني, يعني, كيف بدي ادفع مثلا 2500 دولار سفرة تيكت مثلا من لبنان لأمريكا؟ يعني السنة الماضية كانت 1008 هلا ليش 2005 مثلا أو 2200 لا عندي عائلة ما فينا it will deter travel so you have to take this information كمان into consideration uh, when you're looking at this particular sector within futures trading. The second factor that we're going to be looking at are, now we get into the dynamics of what's actually happening when it comes to the crude market itself, uh, when it comes to the trade, VLCCs, very large crude carriers. Uh, they remain present in increased USGC UKC trade amid mid-size tanker volatility. So what's happening is you have these very large crude containers. They've taken an untypical market share in the US Gulf Coast. That's what USGC stands for. That's in the south of the United States, in the Gulf of Mexico, to the UK continent, basically Europe. The run, uh, continent runs from smaller Suez maxes and Afro maxes. Those are large tankers, oil tankers. What's next? Freight for mid-size tankers has since fallen from peaks seen in early April, whereas you're seeing VLCCs have also seen sunken rate levels un ushering their return to the transatlantic play. So what does this mean? We're going to see possibly, possibly, Instead of using the mid-sized tankers, we're going to see an increase or supply and demand for the large tankers. Leish, Ashan, America has the largest oil reserves in the world. And we could start seeing transatlantic from the U.S. to the European continent, a, a, a spike or a heightened demand for the VLCC tanker market versus the mid-sized tanker market. Future cannibalization of mid-sized 
tanker transatlantic cargoes and covered barrels on previously booked VLCCs making the USGC and UKC, uh, UKC run could at least to further could lead to at least further softening and the supermax freight environment. So when we say softening, we're going to see the cannibalization. What's going to happen now? Are these transporters are going to continue using mid-sized carriers depending on the price of oil, depending on the demand of oil, depending on where it's headed and the need uh, based on the geopolitical tension, uh, if they're able to turn off uh, all of the energy or, or crude oil coming from Russia to the European continent, because as we've seen in the news lately, they've extended, the EU has extended some of the um, embargoes or sanctions on Russian oil for a, a further six weeks or more, depending on the country itself. So as long as you see Russia continuing to supply uh, oil to the European continent in some degree or fashion, will depend on what size tankers end up being used from a supply demand perspective. Now, if you look at this chart here, the plots here, what you're going to notice, Khalini Kabila come in on the What you're going to notice here is February leading into March. If we go back just on the time frame, these dots here, this time frame is when Russia decided to do what they are doing in Ukraine. So this is when you see you see the traded value spike. And since then it's come back down. Now it's at this hovering here in May, at this particular level, just at the same level, basically right before Russia invaded Ukraine. So now it's going to go back to what I just said. And how much is going to continue to, to, to flow? Oh, are they going to uh, completely shut it out and, and shut it down? Uh, will depend on which way the next move takes place. The third point from the market view that we want to take a look at within oil and energy is the way. Is the US SPR drawdown begins and will continue until 2022. What is happening? Nearly 7 million barrels of crude left the US Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the week ended by May 6th. So we're talking three weeks ago now, the largest one week drawdown in the history of the 40 year old emergency stockpile. It was the start of deliveries for the 180 million barrel drawdown that will continue through October. So when we say drawdown, shumanita by drawdown, you know, you have reserve levels. America, is the largest oil reserve country in the nation. Uh, sorry, uh, in, in the world globally, but they're starting to draw down, meaning they are shipping it out. They're using it, so it's coming down. The drawdown means it's coming down further and further, which means the reserves are becoming less and less, which also come in affects shu the price stability uh, or volatility is about going in the crude oil market. So when you're looking at 7 million barrels of, uh, of crude oil were sent out by the end of the first week of May, which is the historic high over the 40 year emergency stockpile where they have this emergency stockpile specific, for specific reasons, they've started tapping into it we need to start reading in between the lines. Shumaneta. And I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a political analyst. I'm an investment manager. And my job is to navigate the markets risk management wise, uh, manage money over a long term perspective so that we're able to find good investments at all times, uh, regardless of market cycles, and understanding what's happening around us and how to protect ourselves using futures 
as part of our strategy. Now, with that being said, this is going to continue according to spglobal.com through the end of October. June, July, August, September. Where they're going to be drawing down their reserves uh, from the US. What's next? The SP Global Community Insights estimates estimates that an average of 900,000 barrels per day of SPR crude will flow to the market from mid April through October with additional drawdowns by other international energy agency nations, raising the global SPR flows to about 1.4 million barrels per day. So it's telling us here that the US is going to increase and end up averaging almost 1 million barrels per day out of their stockpile in mid-April all the way through October. And you have other international energy agency nations such as OPEC. Uh, those nations raising their flows to about 1.4 billion uh, barrels per day. Now, if I click here and enlarge this particular graph for you to take a look at as energy, uh, as information and research, look at where we are now. How long is the divide? Gray is the future where it's forecasted. This is the blue line represents the drawdown. And look where we were at the beginning of the year and look at where it's going to be forecasted by the end of the year, okay? This here, the drawdown begins through October and crude deliveries start on largest ever SPR drawdown. So if I were to take a look at this graph, does this tell me that what, if I read between the lines, just based on my own intuition and research, does this tell me that the Ukrainian-Russia conflict is going to end anytime soon? Possibly, but looking at this particular graph, I would say no. Why? My answer would be is, if they're going to continue the drawdowns in this particular capacity, if you just look at the blue line as the forecast, that means they're going to be sending out more from their reserves and their drawdown levels will be decreasing uh, or increasing. But what they're going to be supplying to the market is more coming from their stockpiles, which means they're going to, in theory, start shutting out Russian oil completely so that it doesn't supply any nation uh, to where any nation that does accept Russian oil would or could possibly face sanctions, financial uh, sanctions, taxations, etc. You guys know the drill. Um, and I'm neither here to say I am for or against. I'm looking at data, and my my job is to navigate the markets. So from this perspective, just looking at this particular forecast, as you can see for yourself, it's going to continue. The U.S. is going to ramp up their supply. They're going to lower their stockpiles to make up for what could possibly be a complete shutoff of Russian oil to the global markets. I could be wrong. I'm just giving you uh, the information of how I'm looking at this and reading it myself. Now, as we move into... The key takeaways, starting off what we discussed but the webinar when it comes to ta taxation or any country that you are in that does have taxation on securities, uh, capital market securities, make sure you do your research and figure out where you stand when it comes to futures securities taxation. Um, you'll find them most likely more friendly than normal equities taxation uh, policy and standards. It's certainly that way uh, in the US markets. Um, in theory, it should be that way in other markets, but other markets make their own policies. Other governments make their own policies. So you need to check into that so that you understand uh, how the tax laws may affect 
your portfolio uh, as you start building and trading into the futures markets. Uh, second, going back to what we're gonna, what we discussed, halla fatahna, the market outlook in a very brief context on uh, al-nafit, the outlook coming from specific research sites on what they're seeing based on data. It's been driven by data, uh, real data, not speculation where you have an analyst coming in and saying, well, I think, uh, in Goldman Sachs, I think this, or from some other uh, investment firm or, or hedge fund saying, no, I think this, where you get conflicting reports, this was all data driven. You've got to do your research. And yeah, I've mentioned it many times before uh, in previous webinars, you've got to know what you're doing, what you're investing in and why. And it goes back to research, research, research. You've got to get as much information as you possibly can. And going back here, when I say this week, this was done last week. So we only identified some variables being factored into the crude oil slash fuel commodity sector. Understand that everything that you read from any perspective may not and most likely will not be 100% accurate as the markets play out. So the information provides you with enough data to take an informed position or not. Based on what America is doing with their stockpiles, what uh, the increase in airfares based on the increase in jet fuel has done to the airfare pricing, uh, what could happen, where is that point of no return to where travelers say, Kalas started too expensive, I'm not going to pay this price, and it starts to drop. Right now, it's on the up and up on both sides. Cost on the airlines is increasing, and they're increasing the airfares at the same time uh, to keep up with, obviously, operational costs and so forth. So make sure when you read something, if it makes sense to you, Aula is a, yeah, I I'm meant to research, or you're completely, let's say, uh, in the opposite opinion of what you just read or watched or came across, continue searching to find what else is happening on the other side of the spectrum. And I'm not saying that once you find something that you agree with that it's going to be right, but you need to know from one end of the spectrum to the other, what the market could possibly throw at you, what to expect uh, from the market volatility, because the market is the market. It's going to do what it's going to do. You have no control over it. It's not going to move for you in one direction or the other just because it needs or you need it to be profitable in your particular portfolio. So the more information that you have من mail تين ساعتا انت فيك تاخد an informed decision يعني والله هيدا this particular viewpoint makes sense بس كمان this particular viewpoint also makes sense بس وين رأي and then you find out more and you read more and you find out more and you read more then you go back to the curves you look at not necessarily from a technical standpoint of technical trading but you use the futures uh, 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 graphs, their curves to give you an indication more than anything else. And lastly, we will continue our webinar series with futures trading, futures within the futures sector, uh, diving in with specific uh, information that could be data driven, also from analytical perspectives on other parts of the capital markets uh, could be agriculture next week. It could uh, it could be uh, metals next week. I will I will be able to give you more details as we get closer, uh, or at the beginning of next week's webinar of what we're going to be doing. But now, hala, خلصنا من شو هني futures from taxation مثل بلشنا ليلي. All the way back to the very first webinar, what are futures and how are they used? Uh, if you need to touch up, 
uh, Adnan from from Thickmill uh, came on at the beginning of last or two weeks ago of the webinar, provided the link that uh, gives you access to their YouTube platform where all of these have been recorded from webinar one all the way through eight. Today's webinar nine, you'll be able to have access to this one. Uh, uh, and you can go back and, and listen to them again and look at the information provided as to Shuhinni, how they're used, how they're calculated, what's the value uh, of, of each particular contract, how the contracts evaluated, uh, what does it mean at expiry date, et cetera, et cetera. Now we've got what the futures are, which are highly sophisticated. These are not uh, securities for the weak hearted and definitely not securities for the ill-informed. It's complete, it's complete opposite. You really need to understand what they are, how they're used, and then at the same time, be able to go in, make the research, start building your futures portfolio, maybe hedge the portfolio that you currently have or speculate or a mixture of the two. But we'll start getting into more uh, information to help give you better insight within each of the sectors that Tickmill offers within their futures platform, uh, you know, ranging from from energy all the way through agri agriculture and the other commodities to the indices, interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. And I always like to end each conversation and webinar with a famous quote. And the four most dangerous words in investing are, it's different this time. This one has come from Sir Thomas Templeton, who was an American born British investor, banker, fund manager, and philanthropist. Now, that being said, uh, it's different this time. Well, we have a lot of things happening a lot, uh, in the marketplace and it's uncharted territory. And America is at a 40 year all time uh, uh, inflation rate uh, they're raising interest rates. Uh, the U.S. markets, the market itself, from everything that's coming through my network, um, is not stable. It's more down pressure at the moment than there is optimism to lift it back up. If there is any optimism, it would be short-lived for the most part uh, before we see what's really going to take place as they continue to raise interest rates to combat inflation. And then more importantly, you, we still have a lot of supply chain disruption, uh, supply chain management disruptions, mainly men, uh, men seen. Uh, they've been under complete lockdown. Uh, back to full capacity. If they open up tomorrow, it's going to go from zero to 100. At what capacity will they be able to start operating again? Uh, and then uh, we still on the geopolitical tension uh, between uh, Russia and the EU, NATO and Ukraine. So uh, when we said the foremost dangerous words, it's different this time. Uh, you've got to be careful yani, because this time is different. Uh, it's unchartered territory uh, from a combination of scenarios, not just one. So uh, once again, uh, do as much research as you can. You guys have my my email address. You're more than welcome to, to send me uh, any questions that you may have uh, on particular issues within the market. And uh, now I'm gonna open it up to any Q and A. Uh, let me see if anyone has sent any questions now. Um, how accurate are these, uh, how, how accurate are technical indicators? Uh, Mo, I'm going to think is short from Hamad, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Muhammad, technical indicators uh, are part of the process. Uh, it's, it gives you what's happened in the past, okay? Not the It does not give you any... Uh, 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 crystal ball skills to say, ah, okay, but if you take what's happening in, in the real world based on 
real life uh, capital controls, capital market, con uh, capital market management coming from the Fed, uh, meaning uh, interest rate hikes at the same time inflation, at the same time uh, commodities and raw material increases and supply chain supply chain disruption. Well, you don't have all of these uh, uh, crises as a bad duck happening at the same time historically, but you do have interest rates uh, being at a 40 year all time high from an inflationary perspective. Well, you can go back and see, okay, what what's happened since World War II in the US market when inflation got out of control? What happened when interest rates increased what happened to the indices this the actual markets themselves from the stock ex new york stock exchange to the dow to the s p 500 uh and see what happened historically could it be an indicator as to what's going to happen now yes is it a guarantee that these indicators are accurate no it's not because we have those other variables taking uh, place simultaneously uh, in the marketplace now. So you have to pick and choose. When I say pick and choose your battles, I would say rather pick and choose a specific sector and focus on it and block out all the noise and go back in historically and look at the charts and see where, where oil was. And for instance, we went to the petrodollar, the America. What happened? Uh, to oil prices when inflation was at their 40 time, 40 year all time high prior to this all time high. What happened to oil Masalan, when interest rates were under Volcker were increasingly uh, were increasing at a very fast clip to combat inflation. Shukan uh, Ambasir to the price, not relative to where it is now, but relative to the price at that point in time uh, to oil. Uh, just giving you some examples. So uh, how accurate are technical indicators uh, moving forward? Zero. But they give us historical data to give us uh, an indication of, okay, Sarit Haida, Masalan, Tlet Marat, Batarik, Haida Asset Class, Okil Mara Sarit Haik, the effect was X. So do your research look in to see how much of the past is aligned with what's happening today and if the past three masalan episodes provided a same or similar result whatever that may be uh, then do your research and see how likely is that outcome likely to, to happen now but you cannot just strictly stick to technical indicators uh, from, from a risk management perspective and uh, long-term investment perspective, uh, indicators to me uh, provide me only short-term information. Historical data with short-term uh, information only, but I don't use that as a long-term uh, investment decision. Any other questions? Uh, hopefully that helped. Anyone else? Perfect. I wish everybody a good evening to spell um, khair. Happy trading and uh, good luck with this upcoming week. Before I leave you, uh, the markets today are a bit flat. Uh, on the US side, we've had a little bit of an uptick uh, this last week and uh, crude, crude oil right now is at 117, gold is at 1847. Uh, the Dow is down 44 points, the S&P 500 is flat. So uh, we had a little bit of a turnaround in the market towards the end of last week. Yesterday uh, uh, yesterday was a holiday by America. So so today is the first of four trading days, but uh, be careful of what they call the dead cat bounce because um, there's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, traps out there at the moment that you need to be careful and aware of falling into. Uh, that being said, good luck.
And if you have any questions, don't uh, hesitate to reach out to me or Tickmill, and we'll respond to you uh, as best as we can. Have a great evening and see everybody next week. Take care.